All right, Ling341, we're back for another round of lecture time. So today we're going to talk about voice onset time primarily, and then uh, there will be a little bit of a coda about voice quality at the tail end. Uh, so the way I kind of want to get into this is by talking again about aerodynamics, in particular about the aerodynamics of obstruents, which are basically things that are hard to voice, such as fricatives and stops. So uh, we learned in the fricatives lecture that voiced fricatives are more difficult to produce than voiceless fricatives, right? So when you produce a voiced fricative, you got a sound source here, which is the vocal folds opening and closing on a periodic basis. And half the time, or not quite half the time, they're closed so that air is not actually flowing through the vocal tract to create the other sound source, wherever it may be, like at the teeth or at the lips or what have you. Uh, so voiced fricative is just going to be aerodynamically a little bit tricky because um, you're not getting the airflow you need half the time to uh, produce the frication turbulence noise. Um, we talked about this a little bit a while ago with stops, the different kind of obstruent. So <clears throat> voice stops are more difficult to produce than voiceless stops, but it's for a slightly different aerodynamic reason. So remember, um, Voicing requires a pressure drop across the glottis, so our pressure, air pressure below the glottis needs to be higher than the air pressure above. And if that happens, air is going to naturally flow from high pressure to low pressure, trying to get through the glottis even if you're holding it closed. Uh, and if you're holding the glottis closed, it's sort of the right sort of tension uh, that'll pop open due to that pressure difference, but then the Bernoulli effect of the air flowing through it will ca cause the glottis to come back and close again. We'll get that cyclic pattern, which is voicing. Um, <clears throat> however, when air does flow into the mouth through the glottis, um, it's going to increase the air pressure above the glottis. So this will only work for a certain amount of time, right? Eventually the air pressure above the glottis is gonna to increase to the point where it's equal to the air pressure below and that voicing will stop. There will no longer be enough pressure to force the air through the glottis and voicing will cease. So vo stop voicing is inherently unsustainable. You can't keep it going forever. Um, so the voiced voiceless distinction in stops will sometimes take a different form from a canonical voiced versus voiceless stop uh, sort of pairing. And that um, other kind of contrast that we see is unaspirated stops versus aspirated stops. Um, and I'll play a few examples. We've seen aspirated stops before, but just to remind you um, what happens when we have an aspirated stop, we're changing the timing a little bit of when we start voicing after um, the stop ends or not even, or perhaps even during the stop itself. So an aspirated stop has the following timing. So number one, a stop closure is made somewhere in the vocal tract. Airflow, you can build that up behind the closure. Um, if you want, uh, it doesn't have to make voicing through the glottis. It can just kind of flow freely. Um, the closure in the third step will be released with a release burst. And we'll see some examples uh, today in the following slides. Um, and because that closure is released, there's airflow that's built up behind that closure, which is a little bit higher than the air pressure behind, uh, in the outside world. So air is going to flow through very rapidly. Uh, the, through the open closure very rapidly, give you that sort of release burst. Uh, and then on top of that, air will flow unimpeded through the glottis for a while in, in what is called aspiration, which is like a huh sound um, because it's associated with a um, stop release burst, we put it in superscript notation. Um, so that's aspiration, we've seen that before. Uh, I'm not gonna do the match trick again, but it's always fun to play around with um, if you wanna do it at home yourself. Eventually in the last step of this, we get the vocal folds closing. So air has been flowing through, but we've closed the vocal folds to um, create that um, pattern of voicing afterwards. Um, so the kind of crucial period of time here is what happens in between the opening of the stop closure and the beginning of voicing. We get aspiration here in step four. How long does that last? Or what is the relationship between the opening of the stop closure and the beginning of voicing in step five? All right, so I'll give you some examples of aspiration in Quechua. I think this, these are some nice examples where it's easy to hear. Uh, I don't know how loud this is. Okay, so you should be able to hear this. These are um, velar and uvular stops, which are either, this one's labeled as voiceless, but it's basically unaspirated or maybe less aspirated than this um, version of the stop. Kuyui. I'll put, make that a little louder. Kuyui. And Kuyui. I think you can hear that really nicely. Kuyui. And these are the velar or uvulars. 
Caillou. Caillou. Right. Um, it's pretty easy to pick up because he aspirates that so much. So uh, acoustically, the distinction we're looking for is um, basically longer duration of aspiration, longer period of time between the release of the stop closure and the beginning of voicing. That's aspirated. And then there's shorter duration of aspiration, or maybe no aspiration at all. And those are what we're going to call voiceless or unaspirated stops. OK, so let's take a look at this. Um, these, this is the Quechua aspirated stop. Kuyui. <clears throat> so here's our release burst in the spectrogram. Um, this is a uh, velar release burst. I can tell because it has a little peak of intensity right here. We'll talk about that more in the next lecture. Um, but it's basically one vertical stripe in the spectrogram going up and down the frequency scale. Then there's a fair amount of time where there's aspiration. So he's released the stop. Air flows through the open vocal tract. And then eventually he closes his glottis enough so he gets voicing, which starts right about here. And we have a long uh, vocalic stretch <laughs> like that. Um, in this example, the aspiration, this part between the release burst and the beginning of voicing lasts for about 135 milliseconds, which is a lot of aspiration. Um, if we look at the unaspirated stop, it's not completely, totally unaspirated because we still see a release burst here. We can listen to it again. <clears throat> this is the release burst. Again, it's velar, so we get this little peak of intensity down here in this region of frequency, uh, and it's less intense up here. Uh, and then there's a little bit of aspiration. It's kind of hard to spot there, but this aspiration, I'll go back to the next slide and show it to you as well, but it's going to look like that turbulent noise that we saw for H where we're looking at fricatives. Uh, and then after that, we get uh, voicing for the vowel, and then we get formants changing in the way we uh, basically expect them to. In this case, the aspiration is about 35 milliseconds long, so it's 100 milliseconds shorter than what we saw in the previous slide here. Um, but again, I'll sort of uh, emphasize this. This is turbulent noise. This is an H. You can really spot aspiration pretty easily in a spectrogram, just like you can, you can spot um, sibilance pretty easily in a spectrogram. The trick to actually identifying this, though, as an aspirated stop is you got to be able to recognize a release burst right before it. And maybe the easiest cue of all, but to make it clearly obvious, there's no sound at all here during the stop because it's a voiceless stop, right? There's no voicing happening here. Release burst, aspiration, vowel. OK, um, I'll give you an example of a truly unaspirated stop. Uh, this is from the, um, the vowel production exercise that's due on Monday. Eight. Uh, so this one's um, got a bilabial stop at the beginning, which is truly voiceless. So there's no voicing going on here during the stop closure. And there's a weak release burst. So K release bursts tend to be stronger in intensity than bilabial release bursts, which is usually pretty weak. Um, and then there's no aspiration at all. It goes straight from this release burst to the voicing for the vowel. It goes straight to the formants. So there's no little gap here for aspiration. Um, and the part that you actually have to pay attention here, uh, pay attention to here for Dutch, is that there's nothing going on here during the stop closure phase itself. You don't see any voicing. Um, got a little note here that vowel voicing begins about seven milliseconds after the release burst. The fan on my computer starting up here. Hopefully that won't obscure the sound files. But anyways, uh, vowel voicing begins about seven milliseconds after release burst. So it's a very short amount of time. You can't really even see any turbulence there. Uh, I will contrast that with a truly voiced stop. Beat. Also from the production exercise. Beat. Uh, and we have voicing here. Um, so we see the release burst at this point. There's no aspiration. We go straight to the vowel, the formant frequency shifting around here. Uh, and, but the crucial difference here for the Dutch speakers is that there is voicing during the stop closure itself. And it actually begins about 85 milliseconds before the release burst. Um, it looks a little bit different than what we get for vowels because you don't have formants when you're producing a voiced stop. You just get kind of that lowest formant frequency and everything else kind of fades away. And this lowest formant is also pretty weak. Um, the fan is really ramping up on my machine here, so I'm probably going to stop this video for now, even though I wanted to go further with it. Uh, but I'll just pause and I'll pick back up here again and kind of summarize what I just told you.